6 to 8. Colossians 2, 6 to 8. So, what have we got? What's it all about? What's the focus of today's passage? Not the brother and one of the purpose of the passage. But it's analyzed. What have we got? What's it about? Remember from last time, Paul is working out in practice the basic fundamentals of how to deceit proof the people of God. We talked about waterproofing. Do you remember? Did you see any of this? Did you? I'm rubbish with you, isn't it? <laughs> Think of any hits, it must have all been you. Um, <laughs> well, we talked about waterproofing. And you waterproof a wall. You take the brush and you brush it in, you work it in. You don't take the can and show it to the wall. No, no, even cowboys like you throw it. No, 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 it's nasty stuff. You don't do that. No, you take a brush and you carefully, you work it into the wall. And what Paul is doing is he's working truth and life in the people of God as he's unfolding this passage of Scripture. Now, most of the commentaries will say, you used to be saying that, you? most of the commentaries will say, here is where Paul begins to unfold the doctrines that were in error of Colossae. Huh? Yeah, well, okay, to some extent. But actually... He's going a long way beyond that, as we're going to see in this passage. And most of it is about what? Look at those verses. Just have a quiet look yourself now. Colossians 2, 6 to 8. Have a look if you've got it open. It doesn't matter if you haven't. See what it's about. Because I want to suggest to you, when you put a wall of words like that into something you will analyse the emphasis and the repetition of those verses, you come up with things that would be quite useful. I, I can't repeat. Have you seen these? Wordles. Wordles. And they're a great way to take a passage of Paul. Because Paul is particularly enthusiastic, have you noticed? He gets particularly enthusiastic, and words come plenty then. And, you know, you can see him in his cell, dictating away, and some poor old scribe's pen is burning a hole in the page, right? <laughs> he's going for it because he's just full of what he's writing about. And sometimes it just helps to throw a passage of scripture into a, a, a program like that that brings out the most often repeated and emphasized bits. Colossians 2, 6 to 8 is about what? Yeah, I should say Hoover. <laughs> yeah, it's about Christ. And it's, the major emphasis is Christ. And all the time he's deceit proofing the people of God. What he's doing is he's trying to work Jesus into their life. And they're Christians already. And here's the big deal. If you're going to deceit proof Christians, you're going to make Christians any use in this world, what you're going to do is you're going to take a dirty great stiff brush and you're going to work Jesus into their life. Because we don't get beyond that point. We don't get more sophisticated from that. It doesn't get more complicated in terms of deceit proving and making resilient the people of God. Paul is here making resilient the people of God in the teeth of error. And here's how he does it. Does it? Here's how he does it. So then. Just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, yes, we were all converted, we prayed the prayer and ticked the boxes. Continue to live your lives in heaven, eh? Nobody's talking about this. What do you mean? Just as you received him, so continue to live your lives in him. What do you mean? Rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Come on, that's a thing, that's for Pentecostals, isn't it? Now here's the next bit, and he's still doing the same job. See to it that no one takes you, not captive. I, I mean, honestly, it's a miracle. I was really late to bed, honest I was. It's been a really busy week. See to it that no one takes you captive. See to it that nobody takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. There you go, the back of the Pentecostals again. So, here's how it works out. For those of you who like colours and like, you know, those of you who are sort of that sort of thing. Yeah. Just as you receive Christ as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him. What is his major point? What is his major thesis? What is the major thing that he wants to see have happen? Let me just check. Is that dark in the screen? Can you see me now? I'm in the darkness. It's okay, it's fine. We're going to have to change. We're going to meet somewhere else. We're going to meet in this video recording studio, which we'll see is out of the way. The big point is continue to live your life in Him. Positively by doing this, negatively by doing this. Making sense? And I've just used a few colours because you like them to be pretty, these slides. 
and also because they're separating out the issues that are being raised. So then, on the basis of what we've already been saying, and I'm not going to recap and, and go over that again, check the videos. So then, on the basis of all of that, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him. This is how we deceit proof the people of God. We work on their relationship with Jesus in their daily living. We do not need to work on their view of the millennium. Right? We're not into millennial theory yet. That, that doesn't help with this problem. We're not working on their view of even election. We're not working on their approach to which Bible version pattern of music. No, no, no. Okay. We are working on getting those people to live their lives in Jesus. Because nothing is going to make them more useful. Nothing is going to make them more resilient. Nothing is going to deceit proof them in the way that that will in the world that they're living in. See, there's a very important lesson to learn from the way Paul tackles the problem in these verses. See, it's. It, it's never enough to deal with an error if you merely content yourself with exposing the follies of that error. That's not dealing with heresy. That's not dealing with problems amongst the people of God. It's never enough to deal with an error just to expose the follies of it. In the first place, the people who embrace doctrinal error of this sort, and its consequent lifestyle errors too, they never do so because they're spiritually strong. They do so because they're spiritually weak. And the first thing you need to do is to strengthen their soul. Strengthen their walk with God. Strengthen their spirit. Does that make sense? Somebody goes off and falls into some great moral declension. What's the first thing you've got to do? Is the first thing you've got to point out to them the errors of their ways? Or well, maybe. They may enjoy that. Uh, in certain cases, you might want to give a slap. But try not to. But the point is, they've got into that situation because their spiritual life has become very weak and they've fallen. They're not strong enough. So Paul is saying straight away, we're going to strengthen your spiritual life. We're going to get you continuing to live your life in him. Here's how we're going to do it. Let's strengthen you spiritually to be resilient and to deal with these problems. They're wandering into personal declension and error. That reveals the points at which they need to be built up and strengthened to resist. Paul isn't dealing here with philosophy in order to fend off the threat of this particular philosophical Colossian heresy. Paul is aiming to build up their spiritual life because the problem is a spiritual problem before it's an intellectual one. So actually, before you fall into some major heresy, let's be sure we take care of growing our spiritual life and our walk with God. Because we make ourselves vulnerable, don't we? If you don't set about things that way. The greatest need, Paul seems to think, is to get back the spiritual strength they should have. And that will enable them to continue to live their lives in Christ. In the first place, that's what we need to learn from that. And where there's a first place, there's usually a second place. And the second place we need to recognise is this. If there's a general turning to error, now be careful and listen carefully, because this is important. If there's a general turning to error, that off, often reveals a weakness in the offering, the spiritual offering that the church is making to those people. Why do people become Jehovah's Witnesses? Is it because they see a clear moral line, a clear way being presented by the churches around them? Or is it because they're generally fed up with what they see in the churches around them? They haven't got time for that. There's no commitment, there's no clarity, there's no allegiance to what they say they believe, and they go off into a cult because the cult offers them that. Very often, somebody gets off into an error, into a heresy, or into some strange way of acting or thinking or behaving. Very often, they're looking for something they should be able to find in the Church of God. Let me put it like this. If we were doing our jobs properly, there would no be, be no Jehovah's Witnesses out there on the streets this morning. Filling genuine and, in some ways, laudable spiritual hunger with error. Because truth isn't out there. Why did the Colossian heresy find fertile ground in Colossae? Firstly, because there was a good crop of actually weak Christians there, vulnerable getting picked off. So the need of the strength in the work in verses 6 and 7 is obvious. Secondly, because those people over there aspired to the challenge of the fullness of Christian life and experience. And they weren't getting it in the church. And somebody was coming along and saying, here it is, proto-Gnosticism. I'm not sure they didn't call it that. But uh, they called it something else. Oh, philosophy. Mm -hmm. Marvellous. How that? 
Oh, yes, we found it there. And off they went. The new heresy called on them to be satisfied with no less than a life free of the tyranny of sin. Called them to a strong zeal and devotion. There was a hunger amongst them that their church wasn't fulfilling because their church wasn't what it ought to be. And Paul doesn't content himself with intellectual endeavour to counter this error, but with the full orb cure of their souls. And that's what it takes to deal with error in the church of God. So, in this verse, Paul shows us, one, receiving Christ is not the end, but the beginning of life. And two, that all growth in Christian life must be entirely consistent with its beginnings in Christ. We don't progress past the cross. And as he does so, there's positive counsel there for dealing with the heresy in Colossae. There are three guiding principles for Christian life. As you have received, so live. As you are rooted, be built up. As you are taught, be established in the truth. There's the key to God living, spiritual growth, Christian understanding. Do all that overflowing with thankfulness. <laughs> Rejoicing is such a healthy and wholesome and strengthening discipline of Christian life. I tell you, say, I do not feel very much like rejoicing this morning. I know I wouldn't, you wouldn't think about it. You would. Uh, <laughs> it's a battle. Spiritual discipline to rejoice. Is it not? Mm. Don't, don't sort of nod so enthusiastically at me as that, I'll feel <laughs> slightly <laughs> criticised. Yes, of course it's true. It's important discipline. Here's separating that from the in that verse for you divergent thinkers out there who like diagrams and colours. There it is. For those of you who like tables, there you are. <laughs> 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 Just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord. There's the premise. So then, here's the premise. Here's what you do. Continue to live your lives in Him and see to it that no one takes you captive. Those are the two things you do. Here's how you do those things. To live your life, continue to live your lives in Him. Rooted in your loving, strengthened in the faith you took, all flowing with thankfulness. Just cover that bit with the other picky. Here's the second thing you've got to do. See to it that no one takes you captive. How are they going to take me captive? With hollow and deceptive philosophy. Philosophy that depends on human tradition. Philosophy that depends on the elemental spiritual forces of the world rather than on Christ. Tom mm -hmm. saying about Skippy. So, here we go. Continuing Christ. As you receive, so live. You receive him. You received him. So then, as you received him, so live. What does it mean to receive Christ? Pete, I want to receive Christ. I'm a student in the university I'm coming to you. I want to receive Christ. What do I need to do, Pete? Go to him. Go to him? Where is he? Room. Where? Room on my Where? I'm very mischievous. <laughs> um, I enjoyed it. It's cheers me up. Sorry about that. Room H. Uh, room H. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Paul is using a piece of technical language here that the rabbis would have recognised that they would have used in receiving the traditions that were handed down. The body of the faith that was handed down to them. This Jesus has to be learned in order to be received. Now there are huge lessons to be learned there in the way we share our faith with people. Jesus has to be learned in order to be received. The battle in evangelism <laughs> is not to start with showing plausibility or whatever. The battle is getting to the point where they're actually learning Jesus. Why do we do that around? Do we get the Bible out? That's a very telling point, actually, isn't it? You've got some good scripts going on your way, but not so distant the past. What do you do? People come in, get the Bible out. Is that the way to do it? That's the way to do it, isn't it? Because God's word authenticates itself. And funnily enough, there's these verses that talk about God speaking in his word. The word of God is what? Living and somewhere active, is it? Sharper than any two-edged sword goes in. We're waffling around with our philosophy. You, you Colossians are waffling around with your philosophy. Nothing's actually going in. You've been entertained. What's doing the job? It's, it's not just, just the Bible. Say again? It's not just the Bible. It's a lot of people never read. Like I, I, never read. I never read. A lot of people didn't read. Yes. Uh, we're going to take that and let me just do that. 
it could be the word preached, it could be the word read, it could be the word in any shape, form or other, but it's the word. word. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You sound like a heretic for a minute. I thought, well, I can't. No. It's okay. <laughs> it is the word, people. But there are people who can't read it. Yeah. What about them? Are they lost? No hope? Many places, yeah. This is why you walk through the door and do not stick a load of books in your hand. Mm. You can have it if you want. But otherwise it's going to be on the screen and it's going to be right inside. Why did Peter, oh, he didn't. Why did Paul say to Timothy, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture? Mm. Why do you think? Because even in the very highly literate world that he was living and working in, an awful lot of people couldn't read it. So thank you. That's an important point to make. I've lost my place in my notes, but it's, an important, it's worth it. This Jesus has to be learned to be received. And it's the word that does the job. Now, of course, <coughs> we're talking about receiving Christ and receiving the tradition, receiving the body of doctrine and so on. The personal object is used in the sentence, so the thought must be of receiving Christ into the heart. It's a personal thing to be talked about. We're talking about a personal experiential receiving of the teaching about Christ. And that marks out the beginning of the spiritual life of these Colossian Christians. But please also notice, it is essential to receiving this Christ that he is received as Lord. He isn't received unless he's received as he is. What he is, is the sovereign God. He comes as the authoritative one. And we receive him, yeah? Mark's Gospel introduces Jesus beginning with, well, presenting an authority that can't be denied. Jesus comes with an authority that can't be denied. The time has come, he says. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent, believe the good news. And he calls his first disciples. He walks beside the Sea of Galilee. He says, leave that, come here. We don't do enough of that. Well, don't do enough. I'm telling people, well, stop doing what they're doing and come and follow Jesus. No, stop doing that. Come here. So, you know, Jesus is, one of the best options in my life. It's terribly good. It's really nice to be a Christian. You know, no, no, don't worry about that. That's fine. You can carry on, you know. But, no, you can't. Leave it. Come here and follow me, says Jesus. And he does it with no reason. No logical case worked out. Not even from the Old Testament. He says, come and follow me. And the funny enough thing is they leave their thriving little business on the beach. And they go off wandering around the place following a wandering preacher through the desert dust. He speaks with authority. Come follow me, I'll send you out to fish for people. <coughs> and there's a James, the son of Zebedee, his brother John in the boat, getting their nets ready. And he calls them and they leave their father there. What do you think their father was saying as they walked away? You're going to buy your amenities nets, I expect. You know, you know that sort of thing, kind of. And then he goes to Capernaum, and there's a guy there with an evil spirit, and Jesus says, Out. And, he goes. and people were amazed at his teaching, chapter 1, verse 22, because he taught them as one who had authority, not as their teachers of the law. And too often we sound like the teachers of the law. The essential element in receiving Jesus must not be downplayed. You have no responsibility to, you have no right to. If you're coming to Christ, you're changing your authority source. You haven't received Jesus unless you received him as Lord, unless you met your Lord, submitted to his power and authority. Just as you received him as Lord, continue in him. Receiving him, even receiving him as Lord, doesn't make the Colossian need here as an issue, an issue for contemporary Welsh evangelicalism. You have received him, says Paul, continue in him. Growth, movement, change for the good. True conversion implies the recognition of the right of Christ to rule and to shape the character of what is worthy and consistent Christian living and to call on me to do that, to change to that, to move over to that. He will call the shots. Christian says, he calls the shots. Keep on with that, says Paul. He goes on calling the shots. Okay. Just as you received him, so continue in him. How? How do I do that? How do I do that? How did you receive him? 
grace through faith alone. Throwing away my own wit and wisdom, leaning not on my own understanding, in all my ways acknowledging him, for him to direct my paths. That's the way you continue then, day by day. Faith isn't just for the start, faith is for every day. Repentance isn't just for the start, repentance is a pattern of life every day, open to live. That is the way you continue with him, casting yourself on his soul sufficiency, the meager needs day by day, whatever the day throws up. There is no higher teaching, there is no esoteric realization, ritual or revelation. To continue in Christ you work out and work into yourself the implications for life at Christ's cross, day by day. Romans 1, salvation is by grace from first to last. Colossians 2, just as you received him, you continue in him. Without listening to fine sounding new teachings, but continuing in him, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord. Continue. It doesn't get cleverer than that. But those fundamental principles get very much more thoroughly worked into my life day by day. There's how. Paul's going to spell out first neg positively, then negatively, how to set about the nuts and bolts of continuing in him as you have received him. How are they to facilitate this strengthening of soul that's going to deceit proof them and make them resilient as the people of God? There are four metaphors to attend to. Rooted, fruits all, given roots. Built up, established, and abounding in thanksgiving. Those indicate how to keep on walking in Christ Jesus as Lord. Here's how to continue in Christ day by day, just as you received him as Lord, continue to be rooted in him. I said continue for a reason. Rooted in him. This verb is a participle, like the three that follow. Okay, so it's a verbal form called a participle. Be one of those who are rooted. Be characterized by this. Be this sort of person. Be a rooted sort of person. But this one is a perfect participle. And that means the action is already complete. You have already been rooted in Christ. You are rooted in Christ. It's a settled state we're talking about. Once and for all, they are rooted in the faith as they've been taught it. Be that man. Be that woman. You know, repeatedly it's come back to me on the difficult days and the odd times of the verse where um, Jesus has been teaching the, the followers, he's been teaching them hard stuff. Hard to take stuff. Not hard stuff, you know, but hard to take stuff. And uh, they all start dribbling away when they hear that. That's a hard teaching. And there's some say, Lord, 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 man. So I'm teaching, they're all walking away. And Jesus says, are you going to? And Peter turns straight back to Jesus and says, well, where are we going to go? You've got the words of this. Oh. I'm rooted in you. Where else am I going to go? The readers have been firmly rooted in Christ, says O'Brien, and they have to conduct their lives according to that beginning, to this beginning. Well, that's the first metaphor, agricultural or horticultural, if you like. The next one is definitely architectural. Built up. Go on being built up, though. It's the going on now. We haven't got the definitive now. This is the going on doing stuff. Go on being built up. How do you go on being built up in Jesus? Tell me the answer. Oh, good, this is going well. Right, okay, well, how do you go on being built up in Jesus? You, you get your Bible up from time to time, is that correct? Maintenance. Maintenance. Routine maintenance. Speaks the tractor mechanic. Yes, absolutely. Routine maintenance. Where do you go without routine maintenance? You tell me. What does need attention? What does need oil? What does need routine sorting out? Because, you know, it wears down or whatever. It wears out. Get that Bible out and get that going. Means of grace. Get the fellowship going. Because actually fellowship with one another is a means of grace. I know Steve Wills all the one-on-ones at all, isn't it? It's called the one-on-one. I had a one-on-one when I had hair, okay? That's a long time before I heard the expression one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, with a good guy, I got to know really well. We poured our lives into one another every morning. Do you remember? Donkeys years ago. What a source of strength and help. As we read together, as we prayed together, as we opened our lives for one another. Brilliant. That's a great idea. The ordinances. I wrote down here, honestly. I wrote down here, the ordinances. That shows where I've come from. We're talking about, you know, uh, what Jesus said to do as a church. Which comes to, you know, breaking the bread, doing the baptisms, stuff like that. Uh, it comes to um, 
to je mogli ući do Izgleda. The ordinances. All the stuff you'll find in Acts 2.38 following. Then what was we doing to be saved? The cut to the heart, he says. Repent and baptize every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then what did they do? They devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to the prayers. They were there, soaking it up. And you find them sharing with one another. And you find them living their lives together in the subsequent chapters. Were you rooted in him? Are you being built up in him? If I asked you for an example, what have you got? Don't answer. Not now. It'll be too embarrassing, but there needs to be an answer. Rooted in him, built up in him. Here we go. We have got another little metaphor now that comes from the this comes from a minute. When it comes from guaranteeing a lease, for example, being a guarantor of a legal contract. The Biosense Company is used in the packery as technical terms for guaranteeing legal contracts. Here it is. The faith as they were taught, the body of taught truth that will establish the Colossians, deceit proof their hearts by strengthening their walk with God, ensure that you are being established in the faith. Are you more established this week than you were last week? That's because you listened to the videos, wasn't it? No, I'm joking. <laughs> but you see the point. You see the point I'm trying to make. Am I more established this week than I was last week? And then, as their walk is strengthened, they'll find themselves increasingly exercising this discipline to be overflowing with thankfulness. Those are the four participle participles that we need to look at, rooted, continuing to be built up, continuing to be established in the faith, continuing to overflow with thankfulness. Here's a hard one. Here's what we really need to watch. We really underdo this element of thankfulness as kind of reformed the evangelicals I do. And it really does expose us to faithlessness. Discipline thanksgiving. Overflowing. Maybe you overflow with Thanksgiving is slightly embarrassing, isn't it, really? For a guy in my position in life, you ought to be wearing a tie. You, know? uh, you, you just, you know, a bit of overflow. Have you read, uh, didn't your dad give me a book by Billy Bray many years ago? Well, you must be the something like that. Something like that. Yeah. He was a guy who was a Cornish tin miner, right? And, uh, you know, God saved him tremendously. And he's got no education, no, no whatever, he's got nothing to lose. He go dancing down the street. And there goes Billy Bray, look at him, that, you know. But he's got reason to be thankful to God. So it's very much an exodus, sort of tin country cold ones in the, you know, down there, southwest. Interesting book, whatever that, Billy Bray. Why do you overflow with thankfulness? It's not if you look stupid. Okay, so how are they to be de deceit proof positively? There it is. You are rooted in him. Continue to be built up in him. Continue to be established in the faith as you were told. Continue to overflow with thankfulness for Jesus. How positively, quickly, how negatively do we deceive proof the people of God? There's this warning. There's a very, very strong warning that Paul is giving you. Lepeta means beware. Be on your guard. There's something to be actively pursued here to avoid serious adverse consequences. And the consequences would have been serious. The consequences, he's saying, would be like being carried off as booty or spoiled from the battle, being made a prisoner and taken off as a slave. Sounds pretty serious. That word, sulagogeo, is a rare word. It means carrying off as booty or as a captive. It's a really vivid term. It shows how Paul regarded the evil designs of the people who were trying to influence the congregation in Colossae. Now the method by which these spiritual common were trying to spiritually kidnap the Colossian Christians was through philosophy and empty deceit. That would be a straightforward translation. Philosophy and empty deceit. Paul seems to have picked up the term philosophy here because the heretics of Colossae rather grandly adopted the term to describe themselves as philosophers. That's what they did. That was a term that flatters human pride, isn't it? I'm a philosopher, you know. No, no, they thought they were doing this in a very positive way. Look at me, I'm a philosopher. Very learned. Listen to me. You come across that, don't you? Is that, is that the way that 
positions get taken and, and propounded and followed and people are persuaded into the church of God. Rubbish, isn't it? Oh, rubbish. You do hear preachers doing that, we can all fall into that. You do hear them, uh, let's, call, let's call speakers, should we say speakers, who think that an evangelistic talk, particularly for a middle class audience, should proceed by quoting a series of philosophers. Writers that we may have just about heard of, but certainly haven't read, and really don't know a great deal about. That's how you do it, because you're going impress. Christianity is not philosophy. And for centuries, people have tried to stress the importance of philosophy in Christianity. Philosophy, as Paul is talking about it here, is thinking things through from a human perspective, without the benefit of the revelation of God. If you can do it that way, God didn't even bother with the Bible and all those people who wrote it for years and years and years. Not all philosophy has always been like that. But in our current experience of philosophy in our day and our age, that really is the case. It throws God out of the first move. Pontius is not about the academic or theological validity of philosophy as an academic discipline. That's not the point. The preceding context makes that clear, so does what follows. The point here is not to be captivated, taken captive by it, and taken away from Christ by this uh, philosophy or, or by human resource thinking. That's the point. And that comes in two thought groups here with Paul. Not taken captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy by way of human tradition, or hollow and deceptive philosophy by this worldly spiritual forces. Human tradition, the, the great philosophers of the ancient world in which Paul worked, the teachings of those great philosophers from Plato onwards, it passed from one teacher to the next. And we know exactly, that's exactly how it worked within Judaism too, from one rabbi to the next. Rabbi Akiva says, Rabbi Shammai says, Rabbi, you know, passing it down. Human tradition. The unifying feature of all of it is that it is the traditions of men. John Piper says. Mark Driscoll says. For those of us of greater age, the doctor used to say. How many times have you heard that? I'd like to stay in chip dinner for every time. <laughs> It would be bigger if I had. The unifying feature of it all is that it can tend to be the traditions of men. Either worked out from first principles, like Plato, or derived from and built onto biblical revelation, like the Judaism Paul was so familiar with, handed down from rabbi to rabbi. The traditions of men. Back to the book, says Paul. Back to the book in every generation. Empty and deceptive philosophy is human tradition handed down, whether Greek or Jewish, and it is all to do with spiritual forces in this world which are passing away. Let's be clear dead religion is not on the side of the angels, it is devilish. It's according to the spiritual forces that are at work in this world. That's kind of relevant to the Western way. There are these elemental spirits of the universe, and Brian summarizes it beautifully, the principalities and powers which sought to tyrannize over the lives of men. The phrase, he says, probably held an important place in the syncretistic tradition of the philosophy. What, what, what he's saying is something like this. Just as tribal jungle dwellers see these dark spiritual forces that work in the trees and the bushes and the monkeys of the forest, so the sophisticated city people have got their own version. They, with their highfalutin but empty philosophy, have not spiritually advanced beyond something terribly similar to the guys out in the jungle. The spirits of the forest have come into town. Look around John Dale. People still worship sticks and stones. They're still captive to these things. It's just they've got a different shape to the stuff they worship in the jungle. Worldly sophistication is no defense against these things, says Paul. Here's the key thing. 
The teaching of these false teachers at Colossae is not according to Christ. And if it's not according to Christ, it might as well be over there with the pygmies in the jungle. By the way, I don't despise the pygmies of the jungle. I think they're rather nice. <laughs> They've got a lot going for them. Um, just as some things in town. But let's not think that our urban sophistication gives us any uh, up on them. The key thing, the teaching of these false teachers at Colossae, is that it is not according to Christ. And Paul is trying to deceive proof the Christians at Colossae. He's doing that by trying to make them spiritually strong. And in the teeth of this empty but deceitful so-called philosophy at Colossae, he's trying to reveal exactly what lies at the heart of the error. And it is not the error itself. It is a spiritual problem. And they need to be strong. Here's the big bunch. It's all according to human tradition and this world's demonic forces that are behind it. And it's not according to Christ. It's not a bad question to ask when new ideas come along, and potential but, but deceptively attractive errors arise. It's a revealing question, isn't it? Where is Jesus in this? Where is Jesus in this? It's actually not a bad question to ask of the sermons we hear each week, actually. Particularly when churches seem to be entering decline. Where is Jesus in this? That's precisely where Paul is going to be taking us next. But it better be next. Christianity involves being serious about going on, continuing with Christ. With Jesus. Never gets more complicated. Now that can get complicated in itself, working that into your life, can't it? Working that into the old big brush. But it never grows beyond that. And that makes big demands of us in feeding and maintaining our own spiritual life. You have to make sacrifices to do that. Look, you could be washing the car. You could, you could have stayed in bed. It's the whole time. It's a sacrifice to get out of bed and come to church and listen to some blog at the front. It's not always interesting. There's sacrifice involved in that. Feeding and maintaining your own spiritual life. Keeping up your spiritual fitness and strength. And it makes big asks of us in not just getting on with Jesus in the first place, but going on with him through the details, through the demands of daily life, consciously, deliberately avoiding detours. More people get wrecked by detours than car crashes in spiritual terms. Loads of big name preachers and second rate academics will write plenty of books and come up with popular teachings to determinedly throw detours across your path, drawing followers after themselves. These are the empty philosophies and traditions focusing on men after all. But Paul is bringing this back to biblical Jesus. It's nothing of men. He says it's all the revelation of him. Just as you receive Christ as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him. There's the problem. You didn't continue to live your life in Him. No wonder you're vulnerable. How do I do that? Rooted in Him. You have been. Live consistent with the fact. Go on being built up in Him. Be those who are going on being strengthened in the faith you were taught. Go on being those who are overflowing with thankfulness. Feed that fountain day by day. So that no one, and be aware of it, takes you captive. With the traditions and the ideas of men and the spiritual forces behind those things. Rather than with Jesus Christ. And here's where we begin. These are the basics of how we set about being resilient Christian people in a world that is quite determined to wear us down. And guess how we deceive proof the people of God. So that the lives that we go out and live are based on the truth of God, which is going to last, and not error, that will ultimately be consumed. May God help us with that tomorrow, on Tuesday, on Wednesday. And when we're not all here able to sit together in one room, right in the right places and encourage one another along. Well, we're out there doing it all around. Amen.
Amen.